Well, good afternoon, everybody. I know some of you are still filtering in, and we're trying to get more chairs. I'm Bill Cavino, the president of Cal State LA, and uh, I usually only see standing room only crowds like this in church on Christmas or Easter, right? when everybody decides to go. Uh, but uh, but this is this is a wonderful a wonderful event for us, and certainly one that. Uh, we're happy to engage all of you with. I'm deeply honored to introduce Father Gregory Boyle, Father Greg, as he is known, the author of Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion. Uh, and uh, Father Boyle is, uh, of course, uh, the founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries, uh, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation program in the world, in Boyle Heights, uh, and anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> Father Greg received the California Peace Prize and is a member of the California Hall of Fame. And in 2014, the White House named him a champion of change. Uh, I'm especially glad that, like me, he holds a bachelor's degree in uh, English and philosophy, but the English part is a little bit interesting in most, from Gonzaga University, a master's degree in English from Loyola Marymount, a master of divinity from the Weston School of Theology, and a master of sacred theology degree from the Jesuit School of Theology of Berkeley. Tattoos on the Heart, uh, which all of you have been reading over the weeks and months is, as you know, a collection of parables drawn from Father Greg's work in Boyle Heights at a time when gang strife, strife was uh, at a height, certainly. He and Homeboy Industries have shepherded thousands of young men and women into new lives and better futures by giving them jobs and a new way of seeing themselves. The book explains the philosophy, quote, we see in the homies what they don't see in themselves until they do. Tattoos on the Heart is really a perfect choice for our one campus, one book initiative, and also for our Mind Matters initiatives. This, this is also an event in the Mind Matters speaker series. The goal of the Mind Matters initiative parallels that of Homeboy. Sometimes we see in our students and our colleagues and our friends what they don't see in themselves. And uh, helping those folks and ourselves to achieve inner well-being is a crucial first step toward realizing potential. Mind Matters, then, that initiative here at Cal State LA, check out the web page. It's on the home page if you haven't seen it yet. Mind Matters encourages self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-care, and healthy relationships with one another. The themes of Tattoos on the Heart, compassion, kinship, and nurturing potential resonate on our campus through our initiatives, through our mission and vision and values, and in our community, and we hope in our nation. In the stories that we read about Father Boyle's book, we see the power of kinship, right? Recognizing that we belong to one another alters the way that we see one another, and ultimately how we treat one another. And we see compassion as Father Greg has lived it. He writes about compassion that it is always at its most authentic about a shift from the cramped world of self-preoccupation into a more expansive place of fellowship, of true kinship. As our nation today grapples with issues that divide and polarize us, the wisdom of tattoos on the heart is still relevant, even more relevant perhaps even more urgent. Father Greg could have written these lines from that book today. Quote, the powers bent on waging war against the poor and the young and the other 
will only be moved to kinship when they observe it. Only when we can see a community where the outcast is valued and appreciated will we abandon the values that seek to exclude. This book reminds us of our responsibility to be that community where no life is less valuable than another and where we see and nurture potential no matter what. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Father Graham. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm going to take this out. There we go. Uh, it's good to be back here. It's been a lot of years since I've been here, and uh, it's a privilege to have you in our community so close to where I live and where I've spent 30 years. And uh, it's the privilege of my life to know uh, thousands and thousands of men and women, uh, gang members who have passed through the uh, doors at Homeboy Industries in the last 30 years. Uh, the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than these folks. I was thinking about a, a guy named Joey Ray who uh, used to work for us and uh, did a variety of things, but he also was uh, uh, kind of, a, he was a good speaker, so we'd send him out to high schools and stuff and he, he was on demand and people liked him. And we went out to dinner, he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly and uh, so he was telling me how to do this, you know, and he said, you know, you gotta pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, that's some good advice there. So brace yourselves. Uh, you know, I always think uh, of a place like this, you know, which has a very special place in my heart. Again, you know, there, there are educational institutions. There are Jesuit institutions in the world, and in, even in L.A., but there's something about this place that has kind of... Uh, holds that so much hope uh, for the young men and women, especially in the community where I uh, first uh, arrived in the, the housing projects of Pico Gardens and Elisa Village. And what Martin Luther King says about church could well be said of your time here at Cal State LA, that it is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here to do some specific things. Part of it is you try to imagine something different. You try to imagine a world that looks differently, especially from the one in which we are currently living. Um, Mother Teresa reminds us all that in her own particular diagnosis uh, in, in deciding what she thought was wrong with the world was that, of course, we had just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we dismantle the barriers that exclude, especially in a time where exclusion is the thing that's being uh, so pronounced and announced? How do we inch our way out to the margins where, where folks are vulnerable, where we stand at the margins? Because if you stand at the margins, look under your feet, the margins are getting erased because you chose to stand there. And you stand there in a particularity with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear and with those folks whose dignity has been denied. And everyone in this room has felt the exquisite privilege of being able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. This is not the place you've come to. It's always been the place you will go from. And you go from here to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it, a place of connection. How do we move and create a movement from being separate and superior 
to being connected and compassionate. And you stand at the margins and you brace yourselves because trust me, people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And you go from here with your education to make those voices heard. It's about kinship and connection. And the homies have taught me all of that and have altered my heart in the process and have helped me move beyond the mind I have. <clears throat> but in the last few years, they've taught me how to text, so I'm really grateful to them for that. <laughs> because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. <laughs> and I'm on the road a lot, so I'm always texting, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW. And the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> which I have been using quite a bit lately. I, I know I can't be alone in being vexed by this stupid autocorrect thing. You know, just the other day I had a homie... Uh, who I didn't know, and, and he had gotten my number from some other homie, and he just got out of prison and wanted some help, and he was explaining his story, and kind of formal. Uh, he tried to begin the, his little message to me with Father Greg, you know, I am so-and-so, and I just got out of prison. At least he was trying to write Father Greg when autocorrect helped him, and it said, Fat Boy Greg. <laughs> So at least I think he was trying to say Father Greg, but uh, I had a homegirl named Bertha one Sunday and she was, uh, she texts me, she's a tough cookie, and she goes, where are you at? I, and so I write her back, I'm about to give a talk to a room full of monjas, <coughs> monjas meaning nuns, sisters, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas, I push sand and autocorrect told her that I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas, <laughs> which, you know, she thought was pretty interesting. Uh, the homies, uh, the worst one came, the homies are always, their hair is on fire, and, you know, I need a little bit of, of feria to completar mi renta, or they're about to cut off my lights, or lo que sea, something, you know, and so they wrote me, and I, I this one homie wrote me with his hair on fire, and I didn't have any f funds, so all I wrote back was, Things are tight, and I pushed sand and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> and he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, you know, what, uh, what, what about my rent? <laughs> so once I was in a car with two uh, older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, and they did a variety of things for us at Homeboy, and, uh, Manuel was in the front seat. They, we just had our morning meeting where we all gather in the in the lobby, and so we're about to drive to a high school in Palm Desert to give a talk. They were going to help me, so we're 15 minutes on the road when Manuel in the front seat, he gets an incoming and he reads it to himself and he chuckles, and I said, "Well, what is it?" He goes, "Oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy, back at the office." Well, Manuel and Snoopy, at that time anyway, ran the clock-in room, which is a tough job where you clock in hundreds and hundreds of rival enemy gang members, and it's, I would not want this job. So, uh, and I said, well, what's he say? Oh, it's dumb. Here, let me find it. Um, oh, here it is. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up in county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> You have to come down right now. Show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we, I nearly drove into oncoming traffic. We died laughing so hard. And then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. And now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no equality. I don't think it even matters how hard you may focus on peace, justice, and equality. The truth is, unless we work for kinship, it won't ever work. 
And besides, you'll burn out. Kinship is the thing that sort of undergirds the whole deal. How do you obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate? How do you stand against forgetting that we belong to each other? For there's an idea that's taken root in the world. It's at the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. How do we stand against that? Even in service, everybody here is engaged in some kind of service where you reach out to the other. Obviously, this is a good thing. But you can't settle for service, because service is where you begin. Service is the hallway that gets you to the golden eagle damn ballroom. You know, that's where you want to get to. You want to get to the place where we're in this together. Because even in service, there's a kind of a distance. You know, service provider, service recipient. Uh, you want to bridge that distance. At Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all a cry for help. We're all in need of healing. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Sesap Javas as a friend, and uh, he was just about the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you were having a conversation with Cesar, nobody else existed. It was laser being focused. He was just so staring at you and listening intently. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if someone more important was on the approach. But once, quite famously, a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual. And of course it is. How do we arrive at this exquisite mutuality where there is no daylight that separates us? I remember uh, No Homie found more uh, job uh, possibilities and uh, opportunities through Homeboy Industries than this guy named Dreamer who grew up in the People Gardens housing projects. I knew him since he was a little mocosito growing up there, and he got into a gang around 13. Super smart, intelligent kid, though I don't remember ever that he ever really did the school thing. Um, he had a wonderful, dangerous sense of humor, which I always enjoyed. And, and, and he's in his 40s now, but he was in his mid early 20s, he was kind of a yo-yo, in and out of being locked up. Um, and he was... Uh, you know, back and forth, back and forth, and I'd find him a hale in some, in the private sector, or in, um, you know, one of our social enterprises at Homeboy. But always before too long, he'd sort of gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, you know, the sale of, or the use of. And, uh, and then he'd wander back to me. So this was a pattern that kept repeating itself. So this one time he finished a four month uh, probation violation um, at the county jail, and uh, there he was sitting in front of my desk, and he says what gang members often say, this time, it'll be different. And I go, hmm, all right, so. With him sitting there, I call a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, a guy named Gary. And Gary had uh, hired homies in the past, so I'm thinking, hoping against hope, maybe he'll do it again. And uh, sure enough, he says, yeah, you tell him he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day at the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is again sitting in front of my desk, and I go, híjole madre santa, here we go all again. I can't believe we're going through this. And, but this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck, and he waves it proudly. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. <laughs> I mean, my jefita, she's proud of me, and my morritos, they're not ashamed of me. And Well, you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh, who? <laughs> and he looks at me strangely, and he says, well, God, of course. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. That would be God. 
You thought I was going to say you. I said, no, no, gosh. God's number one. <laughs> you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days, he says to me. I said, I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had. Struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, I guess he told me, but I, I defy you to identify exactly as we're falling out of our chairs, howling with laughter. Who's the service provider and who's the service recipient? It's mutual. So how many of you here, uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, have read the book? Okay, so, so you kind of, so I'll do the cliff notes. So Homeboy was born in uh, <laughs> 1988 uh, when Rosa Campos was a, just a little girl. Where are you, Rosa? There you are. And uh, I was pastor there from 86 to 92. But in 88, uh, uh, we started what uh, initially was called Jobs for a Future. Uh, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. He had had the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere, anywhere, uh, leading the LAPD to call it, uh, uh, you know, the highest uh, concentration of gang activity. Uh, if LA was the gang capital of the world, uh, my parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. So we had eight gangs at war with each other when I uh, arrived there which was not typical of public housing to have so many gangs in one place or two places up against each other. And I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in uh, 1988. And uh, I buried my 217th uh, three weeks ago. Not all from that community, but uh, I know a lot of gang members I get asked to do this. So the first thing we did was we started a school because uh, there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the, the boot from their home school, Hollenbeck. And uh, so they were wreaking havoc in the projects. They were writing on the walls, they were violent, they were selling drugs, and no school <laughs> wanted them. So I walked out into the projects and I'd isolate them and I'd say, hey, you know, is there, uh, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And then to my surprise, um, they all said, yeah, I would go if you found a school. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. So that uh, kind of forced my hand. So across the street from the church was our, is our uh, elementary school, parochial school, grades K to eight, the first two floors. Um, but on the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived. And uh, so I gathered all the nuns together in the living room and I sat them down and I said, look, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out and uh, we can turn the convent into a school for gang members? And they said, sure. So we were off and running and gang members came in large numbers to the church property, not to church, but to the property which created a disconnect at the time because people started, parishioners started to say, you know, uh, shouldn't um, churches be hermetically sealed, you know, good people in and bad people out. And, uh, hi Brendan, and um, which was a good uh, kind of disconnect. It was a gospel challenge, I would say. And then the gang member said, if only we had jobs, and so myself and the women in the parish we marched around the factories that surrounded the projects trying to find felony-friendly employers, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So we invented things like crews, you know, a crew to build our child care center made up of rival enemy gang members. Um, we, uh, a crew, maintenance crew, landscaping crew, a graffiti removal crew. And uh, in 1992, uh, was the unrest in Los Angeles. I recommend a, a documentary called Made in America, OJ Made in America, because it, it's the best thing I've ever seen about uh, that, that period. Explains it really well from, the, from every angle. And so the whole city exploded, but our little uh, community, which was among the poorest in the city, didn't explode. So the LA Times wanted to know why they came and asked me 
I said, well, I think maybe it has something to do with the fact that there are 60 strategically hired enemy rival gang members working together, and they have a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to torch their community at night. Maybe that had something to do with it. So uh, a movie producer, Ray Stark, who happened to have $500 million, read the article, summoned me the next day, and I said, Ray, break bread, kick us down with some fatty. So um, he said, well, what should I do? And I said, why don't you buy this abandoned bakery across the street uh, from the church, and it's, uh, it's got ovens, and we could put hair nets on rival enemy gang members. They could bake bread. We'll call it Homeboy Bakery. And that was the extent of my business plan. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, sure. So we were off and running. And a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for Our Future to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture. Not everything worked. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful, as I recall. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I uh, didn't see that coming. And now nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we backed our way, evolved our way into becoming now the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on the planet. So about 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors wanting to reimagine their lives. And uh, the centerpiece is our 18-month training program. All the homies and homegirls want to get in on that because it's a paid gig. And then with it comes an expectation that folks will kind of do the work, work on themselves, you know. And so uh, uh, therapy, anger management curriculum, uh, classes of all kinds, case management, uh, free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more gang-related tattoos than we do designated clinic, three laser machines, uh, one paid physician assistant, but 47 volunteer doctors, so we're pretty much Monday through Friday, nine to five, generally. Uh, and it all started because of a guy named Frank, those of you who read the book, a guy who wandered into my office, I didn't know him, two days out of Corcoran State Prison, he's sitting in front of my desk and tattooed on his forehead, filling the space like a big old damn billboard was fuck the world, <laughs> big black letters. And he says, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> and I said, well, Frank, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. You know? And I'm thinking, where do I send this guy, you know, to McDonald's? Do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. <laughs> Mothers clutching their kids running out of the store. So I, obviously I hired him. And, he bagged bread for about two years, and I found a doc at White Memorial Hospital who donated one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and a few others on my list. Before too long, we had uh, 3,000 gang members who uh, were awaiting the same treatment, so we couldn't stay with that arrangement. Frank, to this day, is a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the dumbest, angriest thing he had ever done. Proving once and for all that all of us are a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. Uh, and uh, kind of central to Homeboy are all our social enterprises. Uh, the bakery is thriving, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise where we sell our logo stuff. Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food at City Hall. We have a restaurant, Terminal 4, American Airlines, um, Farmer's Markets, I don't know how many we're in. Home, one thing we call Homeboy Grocery, which is chips and salsas, and I think guacamole is soon to arrive. And all the Ralphs from San Luis Obispo to San Diego. Uh, oh, Homeboy uh, Recycling is a thing we just started, so if you want to recycle your e-waste, I don't even know exactly what that is, but uh, <laughs> don't know if I have any of it. But uh, And uh, Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, 
will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. It's kind of a who's who. Um, you know, you go there at any time, there are always elected officials there, and there's always... Jim Carrey has been there many times, Jack Black, Forrest Whitaker, and... Once, uh, very famously, uh, Diane Keaton showed up for uh, lunch. She, of Oscar fame, a Godfather movies, Andy Hall, big movie star. And her waitress is Glenda, and Glenda's a big girl, been there, done that, tattooed, felon, gang member. She has no idea who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And uh, Glenda, you know, rattles off the three dishes that she particularly likes, and, and then Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds really good. And it's at that moment something dawns on Glenda. She looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere, you know? Like maybe we've met. <laughs> and Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before, you know? And, and then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> Yeah, that just took my breath away when I heard it. I, I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings. <laughs> but suddenly kinship so quickly. Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress. Exactly what God had in mind, if you'll permit me. Jesus says to the gathered that you may be one. No kinship, no justice, no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no equality. In fact, peace, justice, and equality, simply put, are byproducts of our kinship. <clears throat> How do we move from being separate and superior to being connected and compassionate? Cal State LA is not the place you've come to, it will always be the place you go from, and you go from here to choose to be enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're kind of a little bit allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. We don't believe in it. We believe more in holding the mirror up and telling people the truth knowing that your truth is my truth, and my truth is a gang member's truth. Anyway, it's all the same truth. Here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch folks on the margins, folks vulnerable, folks whose dignity has been denied, suddenly inhabiting that truth and discovering their own nobility. And they become that truth and no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But healing is the centerpiece at, at Homeboy, and so you're always reaching in and dismantling the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way, that keep folks from seeing their truth. For truth be told, the principal suffering of the poor throughout history, shame and disgrace, it's the thing that's where society insists that you're less than. <clears throat> what we're going after, I guess, is a kind of this notion that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles in this very odd sentence that says simply, and awe came upon everyone. It seems to suggest that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. And awe came upon everyone. Some years ago I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia, and it was an all day long, nine to five gang in service. And so I said yes, and I figured, you know, maybe I'll give a 
opener keynote address, or maybe I'll speak at lunch, or maybe I'll close the thing. Close enough to the date I pulled the letter out in the not so fine print, I discover to my horror that I am to be the only speaker at this damn thing, you know, <laughs> nine to five, you know. And so I quickly call in two homies, Andre and Jose, and I sit them down, both of them are trainees. I said, look, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I, I'd like you to get up and tell your stories. Take your time. <laughs> because we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I never heard their stories and Jose gets up and I guess at the time he's about 25 years old and a trainee so he went through our, was finishing up his 18 month uh, time with us. But he landed at the end of his phase, the last phase, as a very valued member of our substance abuse team. A man solid in his own recovery uh, and now helping younger folks with their addiction issues. A gang member tattooed, fell in, been to prison or parolee, but he also had a long stretch of time as a uh, homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he gets up in front of these 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish, he said to them. <laughs> and, and they got damn whiplash going from laugh to gasp, or gasp to laugh. He says, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. My grandmother rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, why are you wearing three t-shirts? It's 100 degrees. Then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. Because nothing explains the situation in which we are currently living than this. If we do not welcome our own wounds, then we will be tempted to despise the wounded.
Cal State LA is not the place you've come to. It's only always been the place you're meant to go from to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. And I think that's the only praise God has any interest in. Let me end uh, with this uh, story and then uh, we'll have a chance to uh, have you ask questions. Is it me or is it hotter than a Texas bellow in here? <laughs> Equally. Yeah, there you go. I see all these fans going and I'm about to faint. I'd love some more water. Thank you, kiddo. So here's the last story and then think of your question. And if you're a student, it'll be extra credit. <laughs> so it, it sometimes it occurs to universities to force their students to read my book against their will. Uh, and I'm not complaining. Uh, but my alma mater, uh, Gonzaga in Spokane, number one in basketball undefeated, um, <laughs> they invited me some years ago to speak uh, to their freshman class who were forced to read my book. And they said, please bring two homies with you. And, and uh, I always do, uh, you know, if uh, people pay for it. I just got in at around midnight last night. Uh, from Boston with two homies. We had, they'd never been on a plane. It was just hilarious. Uh, they were asking me, uh, hey, did we fly Virgin? Because it was our first time. I told them yes. Two weeks ago, I went to, to Ohio and the homie got up. He was just, the people just loved him. And he began by saying, wow. And he had never been on a plane. He said, wow, I've never flown overseas before. <laughs> we were in Toledo, you know. <laughs> they just enveloped him. They, they just, they didn't mock him at all. They just loved him like this affection. And he just, and the soul felt its worth. So I always like bringing homies with me. And so, uh, and I always pick homies in a certain way. I always pick enemies, rivals, just so that force them to share a hotel room just to mess with them. <laughs> And, uh, and I always pick homies who have never flown before, just for the thrill of seeing them panicked in the sky. <laughs> Last night we really had some rough uh, a turbulence and uh, this kid was going, I'm not feeling so good, I go, just, okay, concentrate. It's just like, I think, you know, speed bumps on a road, that's all it is, you know. It wasn't working anyway. He was just terrified, but we got home. Uh, so I picked two homies, uh, Bobby, African-American gang member who at the time worked in the bakery and Mario who at the time worked in our merchandise store. And so I've done this so many times, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of times with men and women. I've never picked anybody like Mario who was so absolutely terrified of flying. I mean, I've never had this experience. He was, I mean, he was hyperventilating. He, oh, he, who hadn't even gotten on the plane yet. <laughs> So we went to, flew out of Burbank, and Burbank, if you, you know, it's a smaller airport, big bay windows, Southwest Airlines mainly, and, and uh, so the feature there, of course, is that they don't have that hermetically sealed chute to get on the plane. You have to walk out into the tarmac like you're the president and uh, climb up the steps to get to the front of the plane, and of course at Burbank has the added feature to climb up the back steps to get to the back of the plane. So. Our plane arrives, it's early morning, and, uh, and they're deplaning, or the people are getting off, and, and, I, and Mar Mario's sitting next to me, this, you know, this is our plane. <laughs> like this, and I go, oh my God, he may die before we actually climb those stairs, you know. And so I see two flight attendants, females, and they, they each have very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and the, and the two of them are schlepping up the front steps to get into the plane. And Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I go, as soon as they sober up the pilots, uh, there they go now. Well, perhaps I shouldn't have said this to them, you know, so. But I should tell you that Mario is like the most tattooed individual who's ever worked at Homeboy in our 30 years, which is saying a lot, you know. He's all sleeved out and Neck is blackened with the name of his gang, and head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, 
chin. And I'd never been in public with him. So we were walking through the Burbank <laughs> airport and people are like this, you know, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you were to go tomorrow to Homeboy and ask anybody there, who's the kindest, most gentle, tender soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll say Mario. He works behind the counter selling baked goods at the, at our, the front part of the cafe. <coughs> kindest, most gentle soul. He is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing that world. So we get to uh, Gonzaga University, of course they say Tuesday night is the, is the big talk. Huge venue, 2,000 people, and they really did the work, you know, and uh, what they don't tell you is that they have 93 other talks planned for you, you know, so this class, this class, this talk, this lunch, this class, all day long. So I tell Mario and Bobby, look, I'm not going to speak in any of these. I'm going to sit in the back of the classroom. I want you guys to get up and tell uh, your stories. And so they were nervous, but they did a good job. Stories of terror and torture and abuse of all kinds, violence, abandonment, neglect. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I wouldn't have survived a single day of their childhoods. So the nighttime talk came, and just before it, I, I pulled them over and I said, look, here's what I want you to do. Each of you get up, do a little five-minute snapshot so that I can include you in the question and answer period afterwards. And they were really nervous, terrified. Mario was terrified because it was such a huge group. But they got up and they did a good job. And then I did my whatever, 45 minutes. And, and then I called them to stand on either side of me. And I said, OK, let's open it up. Yes, ma'am. And a woman stands and she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out of the gate is for Mario. So Mario, he's this tall drink of water, and he comes over and he clutches the microphone. Yes. <laughs> and he's just terrified. And she goes, well, you say you're a father, and you have a son and a daughter, and they're about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and he clutches the microphone even more intensely and I can feel the emotions are arising and he's getting a damn hernia trying to come up with the answer. And, <laughs> and when suddenly he blurts out, I just, and as soon as he says those two words, he retreats back to his closed-eyed microphone gripping retreat. And now he's just really trembling, like he's about to lose this battle, but he wants to get this sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands, and now it's her turn to cry, and she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. If 2,000 total perfect strangers stand, and they will not stop clapping, and all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand, so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself, and they, in turn, returned also because it's mutual. And I think that's the only praise God has any interest in. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no equality. No matter how singularly focused you may well be 
on those goals that can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other. Work for that and watch what happens. You stand at the margins because that's the only way they get erased. And pretty soon you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And this place is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from to make those voices heard. Thank you very much. I'm a, little I'm a little taller than Father G. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Robert Vida. I'm a professor in sociology. And this right here is Kevin Gonzalez, who graduated last year with a BA in sociology, magna cum laude, with department honors. That means he did real good. <laughs> we might not look like it, but we are gang members. And we're not ashamed of it either. Kevin spent more years in prison than you'll probably spend on this campus even if you take the long track. <laughs> he is now the program coordinator for a new program we have on campus called Project Rebound for formerly incarcerated students. Um, this program is run by the Center for Engagement, Service, and the Public Good, um, which of course is brought to us by President Covino, who we would like to thank for his support in making this program possible. 20 CSU campuses wanted this program on their campus, and only, what is it, six or seven of us got them. And the reason for that was because of the president's support. If you are formerly incarcerated, or if you know anyone who, is form who has been formerly incarcerated, um, or you just care about these issues enough to come, um, we're having the first meeting in social for Project Rebound uh, this Thursday, February 16th. So if you're interested in taking part, if there's anybody you can refer, we have some nifty flyers, just like the old days for house parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you youngsters don't know about that. You're on Facebook. <laughs> but uh, come and holler at us. Thank you. And now uh, questions for Father G. Thank you, Robert. So just go like this, I'll go. You don't have to come to the mic, I'm going to try to do it a different way. So if you can just go like this and holler it out. Yeah, just because it's too hard, people don't like coming up to the microphone. I do this a lot. So just go like this, I'll go like that. If you're meek and mild, I'll repeat your question. Extra credit. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I was taking notes a lot throughout your speech and I really enjoyed it. Um, so I'll kind of read off what I was taking. A theme in your speech is kin kinship created as no peace, no, no kinship is no peace, no justice, no equality. There's a gap between provider and service participant. Closing the gap meaning is meaning neutrality and healing. Um, I just want to state that there is no there's a big gap between the students and the administrators here on Cal State LA. That um, as students, we protested yesterday. There was there was not really a lot of administrators yesterday who who are trying to close the, that gap. There is a lot of admin. There was only the dean of students there, and even though that she was there, like there was no kinship. There was no participating. There was no mutuality. So it's something that I want to say because they're here right now. So rather than them get a photo op, I want that statement to be clear that a lot of us as students do not feel that can trip here in Cal State LA. Okay, thank you. Yeah, she was talking about kind of a gap uh, here. Where, where is there not a gap? 
you know, welcome to the human race, you know. And so you try to bridge the gap so that there is no daylight. And part of the thing is to somehow be anchored. The demonizing is always wrong, you know. We're tempted to do it, you know. Uh, I am. But you always know, as long as you know that that's always false, it's always an untruth, whoever the demon is, administrators, Donald Trump, those who voted for him, whatever it is, um, it's, as long as you know that it's always untrue, that there are no demons, that's the interesting part. Anywhere, any exceptions? No, there's no exceptions to that truth. And once you know that, and then you can kind of say, even these folks belong. And, uh, and that's kind of, if you stay anchored in that truth. At Homeboy Industries, we always say love is the answer, community is the context. And tenderness is the methodology. So tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. And it's a goal, because tenderness is the only strength there is. And uh, only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of bridging that gap. So anchor yourself in tenderness. Otherwise, it's all about trying to win the argument. And that always fails. You know. Um, so anyway, I suggest that as a strategy. Yes? Um, I, I love the book, the way it's structured as just a series of a lot of different people's stories. And I just wonder what, what you see or if you could articulate um, just the importance of personal narrative and the stories that people have to tell in bringing about change. Yeah, the question is about stories and narrative <laughs> and, and wh why is that powerful. I'm going to tell you what's on my mind right now. So uh, um, there's a, a kid in the book named Fili, Filiberto, mm -hmm. and he's famous for two little stories. One was when I was on a... a Spanish radio show, call-in show, early morning, I was there from like seven to nine, and all in Spanish, and I was talking to the two guys in the studio, and, tenemos una llamada de Maria de Compton, ay padre, no hay que hacer con mi hijo, and, and so advice and that kind of thing, so and it was like, oh my god, it's five minutes to nine, when all of a sudden, let's take one more question, it was all in Spanish, and, tenemos una llamada de Filiberto de Linwood, and I go, Filiberto Linwood. We have a guy who works for us named Fili. <laughs> he, he lives in Linwood. And so then all of a sudden in the studio, hey, gee, it's me, Phil. <laughs> yeah, I'm not feeling so good. I'm, uh, so I'm just calling in to tell you I won't be coming to work today. <laughs> so Fili chose a radio call-in show to call in sick. <laughs> But he was in a wheelchair and uh, paralyzed from a gang shooting and from a neighborhood. And one of the saddest human beings I've ever known, because he always, and had something very little, I don't think it had very much to do with the fact that he was paralyzed in a wheelchair. So if you recall in the book, there's a story of him uh, coming into my office. He said, hey, gee, you know, I found this little flica of me, a little photograph yesterday. I think I'm 10 years old, it's a little black and white fleek. I stare at it and I go, bang, you know, that's me. <laughs> I said, oh, well, that's interesting, you know. And a couple days later, he wheels himself into my office. He goes, I, you know, I still look at this photograph. I can't say, I can't believe it's me. I think we, it was for, you know, uh, Amica, for Amica, for, you know, immigration purposes. There's something, a passport, I don't know what it was, but I keep staring at it. I can't believe it's me. And I said, yeah, I, you know, you mentioned that the other day. And, and it just seemed so odd and out of the blue. And two days later, he wheeled himself in, and this time he had the flika, and he tossed it onto my desk, and it just landed there. And there was this, this little 10-year-old kid, you know, with a big shock of hair, huge, a lot of hair. And, and at the time, Feely was, you know, had his head he was up alone with tattoos. And I don't know what to say. I'm going, damn, Philly, you got hair. You know, I don't know what to say. And then I don't know, is he giving me this photograph? 
or uh, does he want it back? And the only way to find that out is to offer it back to him. And, and uh, he doesn't take it and he says, do you think there's any way we can make it big? And I say, sure. So I go to the Montebello Town Center to the camera store and I walk in and I see the guy and I say, make it big. <laughs> and he said, you know, it's actually too small to make any larger. And I go, I have no idea what you're going to do. All I know is you have to make this photograph larger than it is. And so he, he worked his magic. And it got to be about this big, a little bit green, a little bit grainy. And this is not the story of a photograph. It's a story of the self having been made to feel too small from having been bombarded with messages of shame and disgrace. And his father came in to see me today and they found him dead yesterday. And he just, uh, they went in and he hadn't come out of the room and he was just, I don't know what it was, a stroke or, he wasn't 30. And he was a sweetheart. My life has changed forever because he was in my life. And there are lots of fates worse than death. And if death is the worst thing that can happen to you, brace yourself, because you'll be toppled even by life if death is the worst thing that can happen to you. But there are lots of fates worse than death. Not knowing the truth of who you are, not having your soul feel its worth, not knowing that you are in fact a whole lot more than the worst things you've ever done. Stories are important because nobody listens to anything else. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you. Yeah, like beyond fear. So, so how did you move beyond fear to help gang members? Well, um, I don't know. I don't think it's anything extraordinary. I think if you're the proud owner of a pulse, you can do anything, you know. It's a human thing, not a rarefied, specialized thing. Um, it, again, if you'll permit me, I think Jesus only takes four things seriously. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional, compassionate, loving kindness, that's one thing. And acceptance. And it gives my life meaning to want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously. Plus, in our times, then you can join the resistance in a time when a lot of folks, including leadership in this country, take four things seriously. Exclusion, violence, conditions on our love, and rejection of people. So that brings clarity to me, because even in the great loss that I consider a great loss in this election, it reminds you of what you care about which is not bad. And, uh, and then so you cling for dear life to tenderness because it's utterly reliable. Yeah? Father uh, Boyle, um, my question is, coming from the church I'm working with, and it's, it's confines or parameters that, that they may uh, put upon you. Um, how much assistance is the church 
lending you in this venture uh, assistance wise with personnel or or money or or any of the real estate they own around the globe uh, you know it, it seems like for the most part in my life whenever I've been to church they're always asking us to give you know till it hurts and whatnot and uh, I remember when they they were building the, the new cathedral downtown the big issue was well what about the homeless situation and, and you know wouldn't that money be spent uh, better elsewhere so how does the church look at your your venture in regards to their almost seemingly uh, lack of action to uh, to combat some of these yeah things? so his question is about the church and how much do they support or give money or I haven't gotten any calls from the Vatican to give us any of their buildings over there. <laughs> I'd send them homies in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, yeah, not at all, you know, but of course there's a, um, there's a, yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to answer that question? <laughs> Got it. Um, yeah, you know, not very much. But again, I, I don't really, you know, church, what's that mean? You know, the women at, at uh, Dolores Mission, that was church. You know, those were the folks who, you know, they were the backbone of the place. So church, you know, we have 300 volunteers, that's church. Right. You know, and, uh, and we're kind of the Bernie Sanders of uh, nonprofits, you know, because, you know, a lot of people send in checks of $27. You know, that's church, you know. So I, I'm okay with that. You know, I was reading, uh, there was a Q&A with Whoopi Goldberg, and, uh, and uh, it was in a magazine, and they asked her, what living person do you most admire? And, you know, maybe you would think she'd say Barack Obama, or I don't know who she was, living person. And she says, Pope Francis. And then she adds this, yeah, he's going with the original program. Which I love, you know, because people like the original program. The original program is the not the 1950s Latin Mass. No, the original program is 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 uh, kinship, connection. You, you don't demonize people. You stand with the demonized, so it ends. You know, I, the original program. I was reading New Yorker magazine. They had a had a profile on. Uh, some guy, minister, who's the head of evangelical Christian churches or something, I don't know who he was, but, but he says, you know, American culture is really hostile to Christian values. And I went, no, it isn't. It's, it's hostile to a certain kind of Christianity. It's hostile to hypocrisy. It's hostile to superficiality. It's hostile to thinking that the non-essentials and the trimmings and the trappings are important. They aren't. But American culture is not hostile to the original program. They long for it. Roll your sleeves up, stand with the poor, be the voice of the voices. American culture is longing for that. I don't care who won the election. That's their deepest longing, is to be somehow elevated from that place where, they're being, where they feel separate and superior, because people want to be in the place where they feel connected and compassionate. That was kind of a long ass answer to it. <laughs> yes, way back there. Yeah, so the question is about uh, holding them responsible for their actions and and again, this is a different thing, you know, because uh, it all it always has to do with how comfortable you are, you know. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the monk, has a poem where he says, uh, "Keep your loneliness warm," which is a way of his saying, "Keep your wound and your brokenness close," because if it gets far, then you stand in judgment. <coughs> So I remember there was a guy right out of a long stretch in prison who was part of my council. He doesn't work at Homeboy anymore, but he was, we were sitting around and my council is made up of homies where we discuss the trainees, where we say, 
you know, this guy I think is going off the rails and we don't want him to fall between the tracks and maybe we need to drug test him because I don't know what's going on with him. And so this one guy talking about a trainee who was kind of coloring outside the lines, he said, you know, <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, you know what his problem is? He thinks his shit don't stink. <laughs> but then another guy, Fabian, who keeps his loneliness warm and his brokenness close, he says, no, all he smells is stink. Huge difference. But it's revelatory of somebody who has welcomed their wound and somebody who is a stranger to himself. So I'm in, I say mass in all the detention facilities. I remember once I went into a probation camp. We have like 20 of them, or at least two, used to anyway. And uh, there was a sign in the camp, big old, old sign, and it says, it is your fault. You know, and this is supposed to be morally character building, you know. Why, why yes, it is my fault. My mom used to put cigarettes out on me and hold my head in the toilet and flush till I nearly drown. But yes, it is my fault. It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. I grew up in the gang capital of the world. I did not join a gang. This does not make me morally superior to the men and women I've been privileged to know over 30 years. Quite the opposite. I have never had to carry what anybody has had to carry who's walked through our doors. You know, not long ago, I was at, at lunch, I went home and channel surfing, and there was that commercial on the ASPCA. Uh, and what's the woman's name who sings the plaintiff song? Sarah McLaughlin. Sarah McLaughlin, okay. And it's, do you know that that ad alone has raised $30 million for ASPCA? But think of the images, okay, it's dogs trembling and they're wet and they're bars and they're, you know, and this is not anti-dog, you know, but, <laughs> but on the screen it says, abandoned, tortured, beaten, abused, neglected. There's not a single gang member who's ever walked through the doors at Homeboy about whom you couldn't say all those things happened to him. All of them. And I went back to the office and I, one of my coworkers, I told, told her about the, this commercial. I said, wow, you know, if we were a shelter, if Homeboy was a shelter for abandoned puppies, we'd be endowed by now. <laughs> and then she said, well, but you know, you gotta understand, pets are innocent. And, <laughs> There is not a single gang member who's ever walked through the doors of Homeboy who at one point in their life were not children. Many were denied childhoods, but every single one was a child, which is to say, innocent. Part of the work that's asked of people at Homeboy is to come to terms. What was done to you? No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang, period, the end, no exceptions. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. And when a gang member says, I wasn't fleeing anything, wine, women, and song, I wanted that. Yeah, I go, you're still a stranger to yourself. One day you won't be. And the minute you're not a stranger to yourself, watch what happens. You have never met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. Never. Would bet my entire life on that. So I was privileged to meet Barack Obama with homies and after the LA Trade Tech talk he gave him. And, uh, and we were in a room after his talk and, and he asked this kid Herbie and he says, how old are you Herbie? And uh, I'm 19, African-American kid with a nasty beard. We tried to get him to shave it the day before. You're about to meet the President of the United States. He said, oh, hey, I don't know, I'm keeping my beard. <laughs> and Barack Obama looks at him, he says, Herbie, I wish that I could have grown a beard like that at 19, you know. <laughs> so he looked at me like, kicked your ass. <laughs> so then uh, the President asks, 
purview. So what do you do at home when he goes, I work at the diner. Then he says this, but I mainly work on myself. I found healing, anger management, my fatherhood class, I'm in therapy, I mainly work on myself. And it kind of took Obama's breath away. He shook his hand and he said, Herbie, I commend you. As well he should, because it requires a whole degree of courage. How can we stand in awe at what people have had to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it? In prison, you're not going to get out of there or be paroled unless you can say, I'm 100% responsible for everything I've done, even if you didn't do anything. Even if, in fact, you're innocent. Because they're not going to let you walk. And homies will do that, especially right out of prison. I made all these choices myself. And I said, yeah, I guess. But not all choices are created equal. And that's important, I think. Because you can't come to terms unless you can acknowledge that sometimes people win the zip code lottery and sometimes they don't. And sometimes people win the parent lottery, and sometimes they don't. One last question. Yes, sir. Um, I find it fascinating how you can still not give up on so many people, <coughs> even though they're in a vicious cycle. So how do you overcome that? That's a good question. How do you overcome like getting, being discouraged, basically, yeah. yeah. Uh, part of the thing is, uh, A, is you can't care about results. You can't care about evidence-based outcomes. I don't care what anybody says. You can't care about success. You just have to know that you're called to be faithful, not successful. Otherwise, you'll burn out. I was in Houston in a hardcore gang intervention worker, former gang member, really good guy, working with gang members on the streets. And he says, how do you reach them? And I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Which for me is the whole thing. You don't go to the margins to rescue anybody. But if you go to the margins, Go figure, watch what happens. Everybody gets rescued. You're not called to save the world. You're called to savor the world. Big difference. And you're called to do it in the present moment. You know, a homie said to me once, we're always uh, lamenting our past and we're anxious about our future, but we're always pissing on our present. And the, and the solution, of course, is not to, to stay anchored in the present, delighting in the person right in front of you. And you're not saving lives, really, trust me, is for the Coast Guard. So let me just finish with this one last story. There was a homie named Danny who, um, I knew him since he was 13. And uh, Danny was a knucklehead, did put in work for his neighborhood, quite proud to be from his neighborhood. He had once declared to me when he was 13, he says, I swear to you, I will never step foot in homeboy industries, you know. Mm. So I knew him on the streets then, mainly, in the alley where his homies kicked it. I knew him at juvenile hall. I knew him at probation camp. He went to youth authority. Uh, he eventually went to prison at 18, just for two years. And in recovery, they always say it takes what it takes. The death of a friend, the birth of a son, a long stretch in prison. For Danny, this is what it took. He gets out and his mother has six months to live. She's dying of pancreatic cancer. Um, let's just say that their relationship was literally torturous. And yet, he sat by her side. He became her hospice caregiver. Proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing it. I watched him take care of her. 
And then she died. A week later, I buried her. And a week after that, he walks through the doors at Homeboy Industries. And so I watch him uh, with his arm around enemies, guys I know he used to shoot at. And the bond he experiences now with them is deep and the union more strong than anything he had ever known in his family. I watch him as he starts to inhabit the truth of who he is and also discovers how smart he is, ends up going to ELAC. So one day he comes into my office and, uh, and this was his prelude to what he's gonna tell me, the story, the narrative. He says, what happened to me last night has never happened to me in my life. So he tells me that at the end of the day, five o'clock, it's nine to five, uh, he goes to the Chinatown uh, stop on the gold line to head east to go home. The train is packed, but he manages to get a seat. And he says, standing right in front of him, holding onto the, this bar, this pole right in front of him, he says, is a, guy, is a medio bello guy. And he goes, he's a homie, because I can see tattoos on his hand. Older vato, I don't know who he is. But Danny's wearing a sweatshirt that fills the whole space of his chest, and it says, homeboy industries, jobs, not jails. And the medio bello guy says, hey, you work there? And Danny thinks, well, I'm not sure I should really engage this guy, but he nods. Is it any good? Danny shrugs and he says, it's helped me. In fact, I don't think I'll ever go back to prison because of this place. And then Danny says that he stands and he reaches into his pocket and he finds a piece of paper and in his other pocket a pen and he carefully writes on this piece of paper the address at Homeboy Industries. And as he's telling me this story, he says, I, I couldn't believe I knew the address by heart. <laughs> and he writes the address on the piece of paper and he hands it to the guy. And he says, come see us. We'll help you. And the guy studies the piece of paper and he says, thank you. And the train stops and the medio bello guy gets off and Danny sits. Then he returns to his earlier refrain and he says, what happened to me last night has never happened to me in my life. And now he starts to get emotional. Everyone on the train was staring at me. Everyone on the train was nodding at me. Everyone on the train was smiling at me. And now he can barely speak. And for the first time in my life, I felt admired. And what a gift and what a blessing to be in this guy's presence, to be reached by him, to receive who he is, to enter into the kinship of exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them and there is no gap. It's just us. Thank you very much.